Welcome again to our On Contending for the Faith. Christianity, like all other religions, is basically founded on the teaching of the person that inaugurates the religion. And of course, for us, it is Jesus. And we are going to look at the teachings of Jesus and to see how great they really are. You know, we contrast the teachings of Jesus with the teachings of Moses, and uh, Jesus relates to the teachings of Moses with a little statement, you have heard or you have learnt, but I say unto you. And Jesus puts a far higher standard even than did Moses. And so, you see, Christianity gives a peerless teaching concerning the virtues, the virtues concerning the life of a believer. And we're going to look at these now. And basically, they are summed up in the teachings of what we call the Sermon on the Mount. You know, the Lord went up the evening before from Capernaum, and walked up to the mountain, spent the night in prayer, and then after healing a number of people, he comes down the other side of the mountain, and there is a kind of a plateau there, and he sits, and the crowd is around him, and he teaches them what we might term the cardinal truths of the Christian religion. Now Moses had given to us the Ten Commandments, but Jesus gives to us what are termed the Beatitudes. And we are going to look at these and we shall see how great they are and how, you know, after receiving Christ into our heart, these Beatitudes can be worked out and flow out through our lives. And we will see the greatness of these teachings. First of all, we are told by Jesus, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, what does he mean by that? Well, later on in Matthew chapter 18, Jesus was asked this question, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And the Lord calls a child to him, a young boy, and puts him in the center you know, of uh, the circle of disciples. And he said, um, now look at this boy. You see, except you humble yourself and become as a little child, you will in no wise enter the kingdom of heaven. God resists the proud, but he draws nigh to those that are humble. And so essentially, that is the thought of this first beatitude. Blessed are the poor in spirit. It means those who are broken. It means those that realize that they have nothing of themselves, completely dependent upon the mercy of God. And this aspect, and this attitude of humility, wins the heart of God. And, you know, Isaiah expresses it like this. He said, you know, I fellowship. And I'm paraphrasing these words, but I fellowship with the poor and the contrite. And that essentially is one of the main teachings of Jesus, humility, humility. And that, of course, will lead us to holy dependence upon the Lord, that necessity of constant fellowship with him, so that we derive our teaching we derive our strength, we derive our sustenance, we derive our guidance from the Lord. You know, essentially, Christianity is fellowship. Fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And what are the conditions of fellowship? Humility. All right. Now, the next of these Beatitudes is, Blessed are they that mourn, for they should be comforted. Well, what does that mean? Well, as we look into the Old Testament... We find that in one period of their history, Israel had backslidden. They had got into immorality, they had got into violence, they had got into idolatry and all this wickedness. And 
because of that, the Lord said, you know, I'm going to bring the Babylonians and they're going to destroy Jerusalem. Well, before <clears throat> the Babylonians came, we have an understanding of what happened in the spiritual. And in Ezekiel chapter 9, we have the thought of the angels that ruled over Jerusalem. They were instructed to seek out those that mourned, seek out those that were sorrowful because of the spiritual and moral condition of the people. And God said, put a mark on their head. And when the Babylonians come, they would destroy the people, they would kill the people, but those upon whom they have the heavenly mark, they will be preserved. You see, those that mourn, those that are sorrowful, those that are, shall I say, in abject uh, pitifulness because of the conditions of the nation. And that essentially is the condition for being comforted by God. God is looking for those that mourn over the spiritual conditions of America and in whatever country you are living. And so what I want to say is this. You know, Jesus taught that we were to mourn over the sinfulness of the people. Well, the next one is, Blessed are they, the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. The meek essentially are those that do not react in circumstances. They are like sheep. They are if I could say this, willing to accept those situations around, willing to accept the scorn, the mocking of people, and do not react, is quite contrary to the violence that we see in many other religions. You know, Jesus was likened unto the Lamb of God. And in Isaiah, it's brought out as a lamb, is dumb before its shearers. He opened not his mouth. There was no protestation from the lips of Jesus when he was crucified. And in like manner, you know, blessed are the meek, those who are lamb-like, those who do not, you know, react against all the injustices that mankind heaps upon them. But they eventually shall inherit the earth. And then it goes on, that blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness. You know, it says, they shall be filled. But um, I want to uh, bring out a thought that's very important indeed. And in Matthew chapter 5 and verses 17 to 19, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ wanted to make it very clear that he had not come to destroy the law, that is seen. Ten Commandments, but rather to fulfill them. Righteousness is fulfilling the law. And, you know, there's such a reward for those that are righteous. You know, those that love righteousness, hate wickedness. They should be anointed with the oil of gladness above their fellows. And this sort of righteousness, you see, God wants us to be righteous. And in Ezekiel, for example, there are 17 aspects of the righteous man. And uh, that one is one who indeed fulfills the law. The, the Ten Commandments are fulfilled in his life. You know, he does not kill, he does not commit adultery, he does not steal, he does not covet, he does not bear false witness, and so forth, you see. And he honors his father and mother, and he loves God and puts God before everybody else. And uh, King David, who was a man after God's own heart, he said this, The Lord is before me at my right hand, that I should not be moved. In other words, he was very conscious of the presence of God, and he sought to do all those things that he knew would please God. And so those that hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled with the righteousness of God. And we are called to walk in the Spirit and to fulfill 
the law of God, to fulfill the righteousness of God. You know, Christians are encouraged, and indeed it is mandated by God that we are righteous. In fact, he gives this warning. He said, unless your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no wise enter the kingdom of heaven because the kingdom of heaven is righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. God is righteous and dwells with those who are righteous and receives the righteous into his everlasting kingdom. You see, the emphasis is on righteousness, the fulfilling of the law. And, you know, so many other religions teach violence, they teach killing, and the like. And Christianity is founded upon the righteousness of the law. Then, merciful. Blessed are they that are merciful, for they shall receive mercy. You know, we are a fallen generation. We are a sinful people. We absolutely need the mercy of God. And what is the condition for us to receive mercy? It is to be merciful. And how many religions teach that? Most of them teach violence, you know, and encourage violence. But they show no mercy whatsoever to their victims. They torture them. They do all kinds of terrible things against them. And yet Christianity is founded upon mercy. Righteousness, truth and mercy. And we are to be a merciful people. We are to be a forgiving people. And you see, as we are merciful to others in the like manner and in the same degree that we are merciful to others, God himself will be merciful to us. You see, we are dependent upon his mercy. God is a God of mercy. The true God, that is, is a God of mercy, not a God of violence, a God who loves mercy. I will have mercy, God said, and not sacrifice. You see, the first thing that he did when he introduced himself to Moses on the Mount of Sinai, he introduced himself as, I am merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth. And the first thing that he said in introducing himself to Moses was, I am merciful, and God loves the merciful, and he shows mercy to those who are merciful. And so that is one of the tenets, that is one of the foundation truths of the Christian religion. You see, as enunciated by our founder, the Lord Jesus Christ, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. So we want to be a merciful people. And then the pure in heart. You see, God teaches heart purity. Purity in the sense of motives. Purity in the sense of morality. You know, God is angry. He hates divorce. He hates the putting away. He says very clearly later on in this very same sermon on the mount, he said, you know, he that putteth away his wife causeth her to commit adultery. And he goes on to say, those that are divorced and remarry, they commit adultery. The Christian religion is a religion of purity, heart purity. And we want to cry out as King David, O oh Lord, create in me a clean heart. Create in me a pure heart. And we want to have the purity of the Heavenly Father, of the Lord Jesus Christ, of the Holy Spirit. We want to be a pure people. Purity of thoughts, purity of intent, and purity of action. Purity of words. You know, Isaiah cried out when he saw the Lord high and lifted up, and realized the holiness of the Lord, he cried out, even as a prophet of God, he said, you know, I'm a man of unclean lips. 
and I dwell in amongst of a people of unclean lips. And God caused one of the four living creatures that surround the throne to take a coal from off the altar, touch his lips, and he said, thine iniquity is gone. In other words, we want to be people of a pure tongue, pure lips, and we want to have pure ears to only listen to those things that are pure. And the purity of the eyes, looking at only those things that are good. So, here is Christianity revealed. Purity of heart. And what other religion can say that? And then, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. You know, one of the titles of God is the God of peace. The Lord Jesus Christ is called the Prince of Peace. And, you know, on the storm on the lake of the Sea of Galilee, when he was sleeping and the storm was there, and he was aroused by one of his disciples, he got up and he lifted up his finger and said, Peace, be still. He is the God of peace. He is the very embodiment of peace. And there you are. He is called the Prince of Peace. And the thought is this, that as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are called to make peace. He is our peace, who has broken down the wall of separation between us and God. Peace means unity. Peace means to walk with someone in perfect unity. And of course, the one we want to walk with in perfect unity is the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, he is the God of peace. And we want to make peace you know I had a mother-in-law whom I never knew actually because she died before my wife and I married but it was said of her that when people entered her house you know they felt peace she was a real peacemaker and you see that is what the Christian life is all about peace peace with God the peace of God and we have the peace of God in our heart. And we will consider this as we come to the teachings of the Apostle Paul who took up this very truth and amplified it and showed us the way to peace. And so, you know, there it is. There are the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God because God is a God of peace. All right then. And then... Uh, you know, there is persecution in this world. And the Lord said, Blessed are the persecuted, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. For great is your reward, he says. You see, blessed are they that are persecuted for righteousness' sake. And, uh, you know, to accept that persecution. How are we accept the persecution? What is our attitude you know, when persecuted, when mocked, when scorned by others. Well, do you know what it is? It is to rejoice. Rejoice. And again, I say rejoice, the Apostle Paul said. You know, the Christianity is uh, a religion of pure joy. And you know, the Lord Jesus Christ, before he went to the cross and uh, at that last supper, he, he taught his disciples and he said, I've told you these things that my joy might be in you and that your joy might abide. You see, and so, you know, it is a religion of joy. And even when we are persecuted, we are taught to rejoice. And the joy of the Lord is our strength. Well, we are told to rejoice when persecuted because great is our reward in heaven. And so... You see, it is to bear persecution with joy and humility and meekness. And in so doing, you see, we glorify God. Well then, there are other things, of course, that uh, he taught on. And um, one of the things that he taught us was this, how to pray. How to pray. And I want to consider what is called the paternoster or our Lord's Prayer. 
And I want to look at some of these facts with you. It starts off with our Father. There is a relationship that the Lord Jesus Christ taught us with God. God the Father. He is our Heavenly Father. And when you think of a Father, you think of comfort, you think of joy, you think of provision. Well, that is a relationship that God wants us to have with him. He is our Father, we are his children. And uh, which is in heaven, hallowed be thy name. In other words, what is the characteristic of God? He is a holy God. And therefore, we are taught in his word, and the Lord Jesus teaches us, that we are to be holy. What is holiness? Well, holiness is separation from this world, separation from evil, separation from all that is wicked, and to be joined to God, who alone is holy. In other words, holiness is different. Being different from this world, being pure, is essentially one of the cardinal aspects of holiness well then he goes on thy kingdom come you see one of the great truths of Christianity is that the kingdom of God shall indeed come upon earth and righteousness shall reign at the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and then thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven we are always to seek to do the will of God and God has a plan for each one of our lives. And we are to cry out to him and say, Oh Lord, please show me your will. What am I supposed to do this day or in this situation? And then give us this day our daily bread. What does a father do? A father provides for his children. And our heavenly father, you know, is the supreme father, the perfect father. And we are to cry out, Oh God, give us this day our daily bread. And then also to forgive us our debts as we forgive those that are, you know, owe us things. You know, forgiveness as we forgive, God will forgive us. And that is one of the great tenets of the Christian faith. It is the sense of forgiveness. And we are forgiven to the degree that we forgive others. Which other religion can preach like that? And then also, lead us not into temptation. There is a sense that our lives are planned by God. And we are taught to pray, Oh, lead us not into temptation, but to deliver us from evil. Because thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever and there is a sense that the Lord Jesus Christ taught that God our Heavenly Father rules in the affairs of men and that he guides all things and no thing can happen upon this earth but that God permits and in his wisdom allows it but you see we can be protected because we have a Father who watches over us loves us and has all power, all power is given unto the Lord Jesus Christ by the Heavenly Father. He said, all power is given unto me. And so as we come to the Father in the name of Jesus, we're coming to one who has all power and orders all things according to his good pleasure. He rules in the affairs of men. And we as children of God can with confidence come to our Heavenly Father, knowing that he would look after us. Well, I want to conclude the teachings of Jesus uh, when he answers a question by a lawyer. Well, we all have our opinion on lawyers, and uh, I'm afraid the Lord Jesus Christ did not speak very highly of them. But anyway, he has asked this question by them. You know, what is the great commandment what is the great commandment and uh, we want to close on this because it's very important indeed and he said the great commandment is that thou shalt love the Lord thy God 
with all thy heart, with all thy strength, with all thy mind. And so we are to love God. We are to love our Father with all our strength, with all our mind, you see. And he is actually quoting from uh, the teachings of Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 5 where the children of Israel were taught the very same thing, that their relationship to God was to be that of a father. They were to love him with all their heart. And then he continues and says, and the next commandment, the next commandment is that we should love our neighbor as ourselves. And uh, he's quoting uh, Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 18. He is upholding the law. The law is love. And essentially... You know, all the law is forgiven, is, shall I say, fulfilled in this sense of love. And love is the fulfilling of the law. And we can say, therefore, the Christian religion is rooted and grounded in love. And I ask you, which other religion can say that? And so we are to love God, love our neighbor, love our enemies, and love one another. And in so doing, we fulfill the law of God. May God grant that the love of God will dwell in your heart and in your mind, and so that you too will fulfill the law of God. That is the message of Christianity. God is love, and he so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God is the God of love. God bless you.